Well, good morning and welcome to worship from St. James, West Streatham, on this, the fifth Sunday in the season of Lent. Peace be with you. The peace of Jesus be with you today. Thank you so much for joining us in worship. We're going to be sharing one of our simple agape meals later in our service, so now might be a good time to press pause and go and grab some bread and some wine or some juice, which we can use later. And just a reminder to parents, please do look on the children's page on the church website, and there you'll find all the resources you'll need for the service this morning. Psalm 75 verse 1 says this, We praise you, O God, we praise you, for your name is near, and people tell of all your wonderful deeds. It's the extraordinary thing about God, that he is the creator and the sustainer of the universe. He holds everything in the palm of his hand, and yet his name is near to all who call upon him. And he does wonderful deeds. And that's why we come together to worship him, to proclaim the wonderful deeds of God, to glorify his great name. So, Lord God, we thank you for bringing us into this new day. We thank you, Lord, for your invitation to come into your presence and to worship you. Lord, we pray that as an online community of faith scattered, uh, not just across this city or even this nation, but across the world. We pray you would unite us now by the power of your spirit and in the name of Jesus. And may our worship bring delight and joy to you and strength into our lives. Lord, we pray that we may be different this week because we've been in your presence this day. Bless us, we pray, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We're going to begin our time together by singing two songs of worship. Why don't you stand, if you can, there at home and join us.
He is indeed worthy of our praise, the Lamb of God who was slain for us. So why don't you join me in saying our opening prayer as we seek God's grace to to be in a place where we can receive all that he has to give us this morning. So let's pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. That same psalm, Psalm 75, which I quoted from at the beginning of our service, says this in verse 8. In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pulls it out and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. It's a cup of wrath. It's a cup of judgment. God giving us what our sins deserve. And yet the incredible good news of the gospel is that Jesus, on Good Friday, took that cup and drank it down to its dregs. He died in our place. He took the judgment we deserve so that we could be reconciled to God, forgiven and set free to enjoy God and all that he is for us in Christ for all eternity. It's an incredible deal that God makes with us on the cross of Jesus. And all we need to do is to open our empty hands and receive by faith what God has done for us. So it's good when we come into the presence of God in worship to remind ourselves of our need for his forgiveness, that we might confess our sins and receive afresh his grace, which is pardon for sin and power for living. So let's just be quiet for a moment in the presence of God, and then we're going to pray together our prayer of confession. Aware of our need for forgiveness and God's promise to forgive, why don't you join me as we pray together. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. This is love, not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So receive the assurance of sins forgiven. May the Father forgive us by the death of his son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. Amen. Psalm 75 ends with these words. As for me, I will declare this forever. I will sing praise to the God of Jacob. And as those who've received the mercy and the grace of God, we're going to do that together now in our action song as Beth comes to lead us. So we're going to sing uh, Speak Your Name. We haven't done this in quite a while, have we? So um, if you can, why don't you stand up where you are and let's just do a quick run through of the actions. So we're going to sing verse one. Every day is filled with voices, so much noise inside my head. And when I'm scared and when I'm feeling all alone, all I've got to do is speak your name. Verse 2, we're going to sing, when I wake up in the morning, you're my friend throughout the day. And when I close my eyes <laughs> to sleep the night away, all I've got to do is speak your name. And the chorus goes like this, say it by day, say it by night, 
Say it till the end of time. All I've got to do is speak your name. And there's a bridge, and it goes like this. Jesus, your name covers my heart, covers my mind all the time. And we repeat that. Uh, or you can just do your own thing, like whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> Stand up where you are and let's sing. Thank you so much, Beth. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it, that all we need to do when we're lonely, when we're afraid, when we need help is to speak the name of Jesus and he's there for us. His name is near, as that psalm said at the beginning of our service. Well, we're going to turn now to uh, our Bible reading and our reading this morning is the end of the letter to the Galatians, Galatians chapter 6, verse 11 to the end and Anthony is going to bring that reading for us this morning. So, Anthony, over to you. The Bible reading is taken from Galatians chapter 6, verse 11 to 18. See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised obey the law, yet 
they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and high to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God. Finally, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, your spirit, brothers. Amen. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Anthony, thank you so much for uh, bringing that Bible reading to us. And as ever, for one last time in Galatians, why don't you uh, keep your Bible open or open your Bible there to chapter 6 and verses 11 to the end. I'm the best. I'm the best social work consultant in the world. There's nobody better than me. Nobody. Nobody. People don't even come half as close to how good I am. I've never come across anybody who's as good as me. Lord Sugar would love me. What's not to love? I'm the best at what I do. My colleagues are always saying how excellent I am. The words of a candidate auditioning for the Apprentice TV show a couple of years ago. In fact, those could be the words of any audition for the Apprentice TV show. They all seem to be the same. But we love to boast, don't we? Whether it's about ourselves and our achievements or our abilities or whether it's about our sports team. I mean, let's face it, there's nothing better than your team beating its fiercest rivals so that you have the bragging rights, notice the phrase, the bragging rights at least until the next time you play them. We love to boast. And yet, we don't like to hear other people boasting about themselves. Instinctively, it's not a very attractive trait, so we feel. So is it ever right to boast? Should Christians ever boast? Well, Paul gives us his answer in verse 14 of chapter 6 of Galatians. May I never boast, says Paul. Okay, so maybe Paul is saying it's never right for Christians to boast, but he doesn't end there. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. For Paul, the only legitimate ground for boasting is in Christ and in particular in his death on the cross. This phrase, chapter 6, verse 14, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ is the centerpiece of this final section of Galatians, verses 11 to the end. And in fact, it's a great strap line, a great motto, if you like, for the letter as a whole. If someone was to ask you to sum up the letter to the Galatians in a single phrase, well, you could do worse than chapter 6 and verse 14. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. We heard at the beginning of the letter, in chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, Paul's overture to the symphony of Galatians, where he gave us little hints of the main themes to follow in the rest of the letter. And now, in the final verses, we get his finale, as he draws the symphony to a close with some little reminders of those main themes of the letter. And Paul, notice, writes this section himself. Look at verse 11. See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Paul would normally dictate his letters and have a member of his team, a secretary, if you like, to write down what he was dictating. But towards the end of his letters, he almost always took the pen out of the secretary's hand and wrote the final words himself. That's what he does with this final section, verses 11 to, end of chapter, verses 11 to the end of chapter 6. And the mention of the large letters 
See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Those large letters could be due to his poor eyesight, something you mentioned back in chapter 4, or it could be a way of emphasizing what he's saying. A bit like writing the whole section in capital letters. A bit like all of my dad's Facebook posts. Or a little bit like underlining what is written. Or taking a highlighter pen and highlighting these particular words as he draws his letter to a close. So what are the main themes we've seen on our journey through Galatians? And how does Paul underline them or highlight them in this finale as he writes with his large letters in his own hand? Well, I think there are two main themes that we've seen on our journey. First, the heart of the human problem. Paul has taught us that the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. We lack righteousness. We are sinful. God created us to glorify Him and enjoy Him forever, to love Him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves, but we don't. We don't do it consistently. We don't do it fully. And that, Paul has taught us, puts us in a perilous position with God in this life and in the life to come. The heart of the human problem. But second, we've seen the solution to the human problem. In fact, we've seen two solutions on offer in this letter to the Galatians. First, the solution of what we've known, we've, has become known as the circumcision group. And their solution was, you need to earn the righteousness that you lack. You need to work hard at your moral and religious effort. So that somehow, on that day of judgment, you will have done enough to get in to the kingdom of God. And in particular, you need to be circumcised and you need to obey all the law of Moses in the Torah of the Old Testament. All 613 laws, plus all the laws that the elders added on over the years. That's the solution to the problem, according to the circumcision group. But then we've seen another solution to the human problem. Paul's gospel, which he received directly from the Lord Jesus. And this solution says salvation from our perilous position is by grace alone. In other words, it's a gift that comes to us from God, not something that we earn. Through faith alone. In other words, by looking away from ourselves to someone else, by trusting someone other than ourselves to solve the problem. In Christ alone, we trust in Jesus and only in Jesus, for he alone has done for us what we could never do for ourselves by dying on the cross. So there's a stark difference between these two solutions. One says, you can save yourself Just try a little harder. The other says, you can never save yourself, but the good news is Jesus has done it for you. And we've seen on this journey that this salvation comes in three stages, past, present, and future. In the past, God saves us from the penalty of sin, separation from God. The moment we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are reconciled to God. And then begins a lifelong process in the present of being saved from the power of sin in our lives. A lifelong process begins as the Holy Spirit takes residence in our lives, helping us to overcome sin, not by strapping us to the mast to prevent us doing what our heart really wants to do, but by changing what our heart really wants to do, that we might delight and take satisfaction and joy in pleasure in God and all that God promises to be for us in Jesus. That is true freedom. And this process will reach a conclusion in the future when God saves us from the presence of sin, when he makes all things new and we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. 
So how does Paul underscore these two main themes? The problem of the human heart and the solution to that problem in this finale. In these big letters that he writes in chapter 6 verses 11 to the end. Well, why don't you look at these verses briefly with me now? Notice, for example, verse 12. Paul writes, Those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Previously, in chapter 4, verse 17, Paul told us that the reason the circumcision group were preaching their so-called gospel was to drive a wedge between Paul and the Galatian Christians, to alienate the Galatian Christians from Paul, who was the founder, Paul who established those churches when he first preached the gospel to them. But now, Paul adds, in verse 12 of chapter 6, that the chief motivation is to avoid the opposition and the persecution that come with being associated with Jesus and his cross. Persecution is part of the deal. It's part of the package of being a Christian. It's part of the territory. Wherever Paul traveled and preached, there were some Jews and Gentiles who for different reasons hated his message hated Jesus and everything Jesus stands for and would take it out on the new Christians. So Paul is saying here in verse 12 that the circumcision group who are preaching this false, fake gospel simply want a pain-free, persecution-free, easy life. And that's why they're rejecting Jesus and the true gospel that he brings. Then notice verse 13. Not even those who are circumcised keep the law, says Paul. Yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. Paul reminds us here that it's impossible to fully obey the law of Moses. Nobody has ever managed to do it except Jesus Christ. Previously, in chapter 3 and verse 19, Paul taught us that the reason God gave the law was to prove that we could never keep it. God didn't give the law to make us righteous, but to expose our unrighteousness and drive us to Jesus for his grace. So if even the circumcision group can't keep the law, why would they try to persuade others to obey the law, to do something that they can't do themselves? And why would anyone swallow this fake solution to the desperate human problem? Then look at verse 14. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So Paul only boasts, not in his own righteousness, which he knows is incomplete, not in his own moral and religious efforts, but in Christ and in his cross, because that's the only solution to the human problem. Previously, in chapter 2, verse 20, and chapter 5, verse 24, Paul has taught us that when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are crucified with him. We die with him. Our old sinful self is nailed to the cross with him. That's why he says here in verse 14, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. By the world, he means the world of temptation and sin. Paul is reminding us that when he put his faith in Jesus, he was nailed to the cross. He was crucified with Christ. And therefore, he boasts only in Jesus and his cross. And then look at verse 15. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts 
is the new creation. Previously, in chapter 2, verse 20, Paul taught us that not only did our old self die when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, but a new self came alive by the power of the resurrection of Jesus. We are a new creation. We are born again, and Jesus Christ now lives in us by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. To be a Christian is about allowing Jesus Christ to live his life in us and through us. And then in verses 16 and 18, Paul uses three wonderful words to express the glorious effects of this true gospel of Christ. Three words. Look at verse 16. Peace and mercy to you all. Verse 18, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. I'm going to take them in a slightly different order. In fact, the order that we experience them. First, mercy. Mercy. Mercy means God not giving us what we deserve. We deserve judgment because of our sin Mercy means God does not treat us with judgment. And then grace is the flip side of mercy. Grace means God giving us what we don't deserve. We deserve judgment. In His mercy, He doesn't give a judgment. In His grace, He gives us forgiveness, pardon for sin, and power for living. To take a very basic example of how mercy and grace work, just imagine a child who is naughty, breaks the house rules. Mercy means that child is not grounded and sent to his or her bedroom. Grace means the child is taken out for ice cream. Mercy and grace. Mercy, God doesn't give us what we deserve. Grace, God gives us what we don't deserve. And these two wonderful things lead to peace. Peace. Reconciliation with God in this life and in the life to come. And all the blessings that flow from that reconciliation. No longer God's enemies, but his friends forever. Mercy, grace, and peace. And then finally look again at verse 16. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, to the Israel of God. By all who follow this rule, Paul is referring to all the teaching he's given in the previous six chapters. Everything he said about the nature of the true gospel that was saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And those who believe this gospel and follow this gospel and stake their life on this gospel, Paul says, are the Israel of God. The people who belong to God. The chosen of God. The beloved of God. Now, the circumcision group would have said, no, no. To be the Israel of God, you have to be circumcised. You have to obey the law of Moses. You have to be born a Jew, or you have to become a Jew by conversion. Paul says in this incredible verse, verse 16 of chapter 6, no, the true Israel is not based on physical descent from Abraham, but on faith in Jesus Christ. The true Israel is made up of all who follow Jesus Christ, regardless of race, regardless of social status, regardless of gender. Remember chapter 3, verse 28? There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed. In other words, you are true Israel. You are the beloved of God. You are the people of God. You belong to God. You are chosen of God. If you belong to Christ and your heirs according to the promise. So as we come into land today and as we draw Galatians to a close, 
I have a simple take home for you. What are you trusting in as the solution to your sinfulness and estrangement from God? What am I trusting in as the solution to my sin and my estrangement from God? Are you putting your confidence in yourself, in your own moral and religious works, hoping that somehow they will set you right with God, hoping that somehow on that day of judgment your good deeds will outweigh your bad and you'll get in to the kingdom of heaven. Is that where you're putting your trust? If it is, please don't. Please don't. It's a fool's errand. Instead, put your trust wholly in Jesus Christ, in His love for you, in His death for you, in His resurrection for you. For salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. So may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And may that boasting last for all eternity to the endless glory of God. Let's pray. Lord, as we come into land at the end of Paul's letter to the Galatians, it's been pretty deep dense theology but Lord it's one of the most important pieces of literature that's ever been written for in this little letter of just six chapters we find the only solution to the problem that every human being wrestles with how can we be put right with you God Thank you for teaching us that it's only by your grace, only through faith, only in Christ. Lord, forgive us when we look to anything else to save us. Help us to look to you and you alone. Thank you, Jesus, for your death for us for your love for us. How deep the Father's love for us. We're going to stand and sing that very song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. May I boast in nothing but the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's sing.
Amen. The night before Jesus went to that cross on our behalf, he shared uh, the Passover meal with his disciples. And Jesus loved to share meals. He loved to share food with people. One of my favorite programs on TV is MasterChef. And uh, the amateurs are on at the moment. And very often when they're asked uh, as they come on to the show, why do you love cooking? Uh, so many times the answer is because it brings people together and enables you to share relationship with each other. And I'm sure that's one of the major reasons why Jesus loved to share meals with people, with all kinds of people. He just loved to bring people together and to share relationship with people. And food was a vehicle for doing that. And so the early church adopted that pattern. They would share a meal together. They called it the agape meal, the love feast. And as they shared food together, they would remember all that Jesus did for them. We're going to do that in a very simple way now. I'm going to pray a prayer of thanksgiving for our food and drink, and then uh, we're going to share that wherever you are today. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. We give you thanks for this food and this drink. Bless us as we share it now in the name of our risen Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's share. We're going to pray together now, and Jacqueline is going to lead us in our prayers this morning. So Jacqueline, over to you. Heavenly Father, have mercy on your creation. At a time where we're seeing the very best and the very worst of people, have mercy on us. The murder of Sarah Everard is so close to home. We pray for her family, for her friends and everyone impacted by this femicide and other acts of violence towards women. A spotlight has been brought to the fear women feel every day just going about their everyday activities. May this realisation cause us all to reassess our thoughts, words and actions, to proactively create a safer world for all. A world in which women are used as weapons of warfare and where misogyny is no longer a construct. We pray for the wisdom in government, in churches, in media, in education, in charities and all places of influence on how to implement and influence change in a meaningful way. Lord, will you have mercy on us? We realise, Lord, how fragile earthly authorities can be as we see civil unrest indiscriminately all over the world in dictatorships and democracies. We ask, Lord, for your intervention. We seek leaders who are governing with godly perspectives, protecting the poor, the oppressed and the marginalised. Lord, have mercy on us. We ask, Lord, for those that are bereaved, that you will provide comfort. For those who are sick, that you will bring healing. For those who are anxious, that you will allay their anxieties. In particular, we pray for young people who have returned to school. We ask for their protection and their safety. We ask for their development and general well-being to be assured. Lord, will you have mercy on us? 
We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. And as you taught us to pray, we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jacqueline, for leading us in prayer today. Before we sing uh, our final song and have our blessing, just one or two notices. Uh, do join us online on Wednesday this week for Word for Wednesday as we move to the second of the 12 minor prophets and the prophet Joel. And then next Sunday, Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week, join us for morning worship online. That's the 28th of March, 10.30 online next Sunday, Palm Sunday. Uh, last week, the PCC, the church council here at St. James, discussed a, a roadmap to freedom, uh, how we can, uh, in a phased and incremental way, get back to normal life here at St. James. Uh, the, the ultimate target is for a full opening is September, probably, uh, depending on how things go uh, uh, between now and then. But the first phase of that opening up and returning to normal uh, will be to begin showing the pre-recorded service on the big screen here in church from Good Friday. So at 10.30 on Good Friday, we'll resume showing the pre-recorded service on the screen here in church. Uh, so please join us uh, if you want to do that, particularly if you can't uh, access that at home. Uh, you'd be welcome to join us. And then just keep your eyes out in the notice sheet uh, and uh, on other platforms for the other phases of our gradual opening up and returning to normal. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. What better hymn could there be to end this series in Paul's letter to the Galatians? Let's stand, shall we, if we can, and sing this glorious hymn together.
So now may the peace of God, the peace that comes as a result of the mercy and grace of God, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the fullness of the blessing of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon you, upon those you love and pray for this day and until Jesus comes again and finishes the work He began on the cross and finishes the work He began in our lives when we see Him face to face and glorify Him forever. Amen. Friends, go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.